so I'm going to uh, be talking about uh, some story that uh, has some flavors of uh, trying to you know, uh, connect uh, some questions around uh, deep learning and maybe some of these theoretical properties, but also with an eye looking at the applications. And in particular, I'm here in place of a lot of physicists, so trying to also keep, keep an emphasis on physics applications. So uh, before I start on the, on the specific things, just one slide to, you know, to set the tone. So we, we all have seen that uh, you know, when, we, when we refer to deep learning, we're in fact referring to a very, very specific set of applications, very, set of, very specific set of inputs. Most of them, they have a very specific, let's say, regular sampling structure. So we know how to use uh, these, these models to do very fancy things with images, you know, like translate between animals and you know, translate between painters. We know how to also do very well at speech recognition with these, with these systems, and also, let's say, machine translation, like uh, just translating languages. So these are all examples of uh, you know, uh, neural networks that are far from being black boxes, right? I mean, there's a lot of prior knowledge that is included into the design and the architecture of these models. In particular, uh, they really leverage the fact that these signals are you know, living on a regular grid, and they have very specific uh, uh, statistical properties. To, to use what's, I mean, this is basically this is very specific uh, architectural choice that is convolutional. And so the question here, this motivation is, I mean, what kind of uh, properties, uh, what geometric structure in the input is actually being used by these models? And how, if we maybe understand it, how can we now take it to the next level, right? And use it on things that are not just defined on regular grids. So what are the things that are not defined on regular grids where one would like to do learning? So, for example, um, one can be interested in looking at problems uh, arising in statistics, even in, I mean, even I would say like statistical physics, right? For example, inferring community structure in a graph, in a random graph. Uh, or one can be interested in, you know, uh, uh, understanding doing data mining on networks of citations, networks of whatever, like recommendation systems, things like that. Uh, computer graphics, uh, high energy physics that I will describe very briefly and even like uh, uh, things on computational chemistry, right? So these are all instances of data that has super clear, rich geometrical structure, but it's not something that you can just deploy, you cannot just take your favorite uh, convolutional neural network and just apply it happily on this model. Uh, another thing that is uh, also like a, a motivation and that, that might also uh, motive, I mean, explain why, what, why, why we might care about going beyond this like a uh, world of complex is essentially the idea that through the geometry, we can encode a lot of things that we know about the system. For example, you know, we, we might uh, know that we are you know, trying to learn on a system that has some symmetries. No? For example, uh, you know, symplectic symmetry, or you know, we can be writing for, infer like, uh, you know, some hyperbolic geometry into the model. How can we, you know, how can we infuse that into the neural net, into the deep learning system? So how can we keep the best things of deep neural networks while being able to make them more structured? For example, another motivation is if we want to be uh, doing a deep learning on particle physics, and we might be, you know, we might we are working under uh, specific uh, uh, quantum field theories, there might be a natural way to compare things, right? So ca how can we incorporate this this physics knowledge into these systems? Uh, and another thing that I will very uh, touch very briefly, that is uh, also part of the results that will be covered here, has to do with this uh, important problem in which basically Lenka is one of the uh, main uh, leaders is trying to understand the limits of a statistical inference. In other, in other words, the computational limits of statistical inference. Right. So there's many problems that are formulated, most of them are on graphs, on like systems of particles, in which there's some signal that is hidden on noise. And so the question is, well, how much signal do I need to observe to be able to to, uh, to extract it from the noise? And so there's one answer, one one way to answer this question is like a statistical. Okay, how much? Uh, uh, how much uh, signal to noise I need to know? I need to 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 have in order for the likelihood ratio to be you know uh, giving me a good solution. But this sometimes uh, brings us into algorithms that are completely intractable. Right? There's problems that become uh, impossible to scale as the system grows. So that the, a much more let's say natural and in, a, in some sense hard question is what are the limits of computationally tractable algorithms? Right? And so what I, what I will be bringing up here is the notion of maybe in this kind of regime where you know, uh, there's some signal in there that we want to extract, but we don't have a good tractable algorithm to find it. Can we learn it? And can we learn it with these models, right? The models that basically do deep learning, deep learning on graphs. Okay, so uh, 
to start, we, we can start with the things that we know and that, you know, it's kind of a, uh, like a proven ground and, and, and things that are uh, essentially uh, uh, robust and, and know that work. It's basically how can we uh, extract the geometric stability on natural images, right? And, and how can we do kind of, how can we give this interpretation of what these convolutional neural networks are doing? So the setup is, uh, you know, very uh, standard is that now we have a, Essentially, uh, someone said it that in this morning, uh, we have a curve fitting problem, right? That the curve fitting is in this super high dimensional space. So the data points that we have are not just points in a high dimensional space, they are functions, right? So every data point is, uh, you know, one of these images. You can see there's a small function where the U is indexing the pixels, right? And the pixels might be in a two degree or in a one degree, whatever you prefer. And then the goal of the game is to really solve a like an interpolation problem, right? Where we, we want to find, we're going to figure out the value of some function that is mapping the images to some target space. It can be like uh, labels or it can be the location of things, right? And so the only thing uh, we observe about this function is the value of its function in some training point, right? So we, we are in this interpolation problem. So in order to even think about it, we need to assume something, right? We need, we need to make assumptions on the regularity on the function that we want to interpolate, right? So basically, what are the assumptions that we typically make in these models directly or indirectly on the, basically the function that we need to solve? So, uh, what, what, I mean, one, one assumption that is particularly important in this, uh, in, this con in this context and that will be some essentially the, our tool to generalization is this notion that these functions that we want to approximate, they are stable with respect to a different form of noise. It's not the standard noise that you have in statistics where you add uh, Gaussian noise to the input. You are going to be adding noise to the coordinates of the pixels, right? So rather than uh, adding noise to the colors, you add noise into the locations. And so why is this a good motivation? You know, the, these kind of transformations, this kind of what we call geometric noise, they are modeling things that are super, that, that are kind of natural, right? When it comes to treating images. For example, you can move things around. You can model, a, 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 let's say, a rotation. You can model a change of scale. Okay, and so because it's a form of noise, we have to think about how to measure the variance of the noise, right? So how much noise are we adding? So this depends on essentially how much are we stretching the domain, right? So if you take an image, a grid, and you just completely break the grid, right? You might expect your image to become like a, a garbage, right? But if you take the grid and you just stretch it a little bit in this sense, you might expect the, uh, the output to be not changed too much, right? So this is something that we, you know, that we can... Uh, we can uh, we can apply very uh, quite uh, quite efficiently to describe to model lots of things that happen in, in real life where we know that the function that we want to solve like say the classification function is stable against right so we have this prior how are we going to leverage this prior so what 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 kind of a machine learning system is consi is consistent with this form of noise so no surprise Right, that a, a very good candidate that leverages this kind of stability is the model, like the famous convolutional neural network model by my, my co our colleague uh, Jan, uh, kind of pioneered in like already many years ago. Right, so convolutional neural network, I, I probably don't need to, to, to present to the audience what this is. It's this model where it, uh, we just uh, repeat again and again the same very basic operation, which consists in taking some uh, signal, like uh, defined over different channels, and just applying this uh, localized convolutional kernel, so the fact that it's localized is very important, as we will as we will see later, right? We apply this localized convolutional kernel where with the, all the repeated parameters are shared, that is a path to this uh, uh, pointwise activation function, and then uh, you can uh, you know you can top the whole thing, that the whole structure, you can interleave with uh, other like bells and whistles, like uh, you know like a local pooling, normalization, etc. So. I'm not going to, of course, delve into the mathematical reasons why this is a model that is consistent with stability. Uh, in fact, there, but there's two kind of qualitative uh, arguments that are kind of uh, fundamental here. The first one is that these layers, right, that these, um, you know, the, the, what these neural network uh, convolutional neural networks are doing, basically they, they are compatible with the underlying group structure of the deformation, right? So, so when I define this deformation, I told you that the only thing I really care is how the, how the grid is stretched or expanded, right? So basically all the rigid transformations of the grid, they are kind of in, invisible to the functions that we care about, right? So the natural uh, symmetries that we, are, that we have here are basically the symmetries of the translation group, right? So that's kind of uh, results in convolutions. But not only that, we need the kernels to be localized in space, 
because what we have in practice is not a rigid translation, right? What we have in practice is something that it only is like, looks like a local translation, right? So the locality of the kernel here is very important. And actually, you can, you can prove these things uh, like, uh, uh, rigorously. And actually, this is what, what was done by uh, my advisor, Stefan, a few years ago when we kind of, me and several other people, tried to generalize it into other contexts. But of course, I mean, the, the stability just uh, here, just as a comment, and I don't know to what extent in physics, uh, you might also have this thing, is that it's only part of the story, right? I mean, you can, you can be very stable by just mapping everything to zero, right? And so here, the, 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 one of the mysteries that uh, it, it was already mentioned uh, to this morning, that still that things that we still don't understand about deep learning is not so much how they can be stable, but how can they can be stable while being so rich, right? Being able to extract so much uh, discriminative information. But this is for another, for another day. So now we are going to now uh, think about this problem of now how can we replicate this success story by replacing the grid, you know, the, where images live, with something that is not a Euclidean domain, right? Something that can be more general. So we just, we, we just replace our domain where pixels live with a general metric domain, and we can model it here with a graph, right? So now we are going to think about our data as being functions that live on a graph, right, on a graph G. And we just think for a second about the directed, uh, undirected graphs. And so uh, what the first thing is that we need to, to, uh, to define what do we mean by a deformation, right? In an image, it makes a lot of sense to take a, a grid and just, you know, deform an image. What does it mean to deform a graph, right? Or what does it mean to deform a signal that lives in a general domain? So um, one can think about the deformation Right? Uh, uh, no, no. Actually, uh, by definition, we define it as a change of variables. Right? So if you, if you, from, you, from the formula of change of variables, you can see that basically when we apply a change of variables, we are directly changing the metric. Right? You can rewrite the change of variables basically in terms of the initial signals, but where the metric has changed. Right? And the cost I pay, the, the price to pay to make this information is essentially the, something that, uh, that involves the Jacobian and the determinant of the Jacobian of the change of variable. Right? And so, the, the, our deformation cost that we defined before is essentially a, a, a cost that we pay of how much the metric changes with respect to the original metric, right? And so now the question is, well, how can we define this, uh, you know, uh, how can we define a metric and a change of metric in a general graph? Okay, so this is a... And so one possible uh, way to do that, by no means the only one, is to, uh, to use that ideas coming again actually from, from physics, no? I mean, the, like this, this notion of diffusion distance, right? So, so one way to define a distance from, on a graph is basically take, we take a graph this, that is characterized by the adjacency matrix, and we, we, when we renormalize the, the adjacency matrix so that we get like a Markov chain, like some kind of diffusion process, and now we can compare the distance between two nodes in, in, the, in the sense of, okay, if we hit, let's say, uh, if, we light, we light, if, we light, if we light up, node i and node j, and we just let the diffusion process run for a certain number of time, after t uh, units of time, how much different the two distributions are, right? So, so this defines actually a distance. It's called like a, a diffusion distance that was developed and studied a lot by Rafi Kaufman and some of their collaborators. And so this actually uh, leads to a notion of distance between two graphs, between two domains, right? which essentially tries to align, like by just solving a kind of a look at for all possible permutations of the nodes of one graph and the other, in a way that the two kind of diffusion operators are basically defining the, the, the distances are as close as possible. So for those of you who are familiar with these stories, this is actually a stronger version of the, what's called the gromov of distance. Okay, so it's a stronger distance and to some extent it's a bit more boring, right? Because uh, the gromov of in a sense, is harder to, to work with because it's not just the distance between operators, it's something a bit more complicated. Okay. And so, uh, okay, so that's the distance between graphs. And, and now when, when we have this notion of like deformation, we can ask the same question as before, right? We would like to find a representation of signal defined on a graph, right? That is kind of uniformly stable, right? So as, as, as we, I mean, for independently of the high frequency content of the signal, we would like that if we change the domain a little bit, right? If we change the metric a little bit, the representation should change a little bit, right? So we don't want a representation that overfits to a particular domain, right? And this, in a sense, uh, is motivated by, you know, uh, as I said, there's a motivation coming from computer vision, but there's a motivation also coming from physics, right? That many of the, you know, systems, Hamiltonian systems that we know of might have this property, right? That if you change a little bit the, you know, the initial configurations, the, the resulting dynamics are not going to change too much. Of course, this is not true universally, 
But at least for the cases where we can have stability, we, it's a reasonable condition to ask. So the question is, okay, this is our prior, right? This is, the, this is our wish list. How can we get such representation? How can we build something that satisfies this property? So before, I showed you in the case of images, one possible way to do it, right? The kind of hand wavy, but you know, these comp nets, they seem to be uh, aligned with this wish list. So how can we do the same thing for graphs? So let's, let's, if, we can revisit a if we revisit what the convolutional neural network is doing, as I told you, every layer is just a bunch of localized filters, right? localized convolutions that are propagated to the next level. So in a sense, localized filters, they, they cannot be very different than just a bunch of local derivatives, partial derivatives. Right? I mean, the, if you have the, all the partial derivatives along all directions, you can just build, you know, by just learning linear combinations, you can express any localized filter. Right? And so it turns out that localized partial derivatives here, they have a very nice, a very intrinsic relationship with the deformations that I told you about. Right? So these are basically linear operators that nearly commute with, local, with deformations. Right? So they are not, in general, uh, gonna, they are, we cannot have a commutation error that is zero because these are basically operators that are convolutions. And this operator here, as I told you, it's not necessarily like a rigid translation. Right? It can be something uh, uh, further. But in a sense, it has a, like a small commutation error. And so the question is, well, in a, in a general grid, we have this kind of dictionary of uh, differential operators that have this small commutation error. Can we have a general, like a, for a general graph, how, how can we get an equivalent dictionary, or something that looks the same? So it turns out that, well, in a general graph, we don't have such a dictionary that is so rich. We don't have the notion of partial derivative. But we have a notion of basically a low pass filter, right? We can diffuse information on a graph, right? We can take a signal on a graph and multiply by its adjacency matrix, right? This is kind of producing a low pass filter. And now if you combine this low pass, low pass filter with the all pass filter, which is basically just normalizing the signal as it is, we can learn, we can construct high pass filters, right? And so the idea here on, on this actually graph neural network model that was uh, introduced in a completely different context by uh, researchers in, in Italy uh, on a completely different uh, construction. Essentially, it's, it's a very, in a sense, it's like a poor man's, ver it's a poor man's version of a confnet, but now I can define it in a general domain. And I don't even need the domain to be fixed, right? So it, nothing in this model assumes that domain is, is fixed, right? So, uh, so because if I change the domain, what will change are the operators that are associated with the domain. So I can basically share parameters and leverage information across different domains, different graphs. Okay, and so, so there's a number of uh, uh, very interesting and very nice uh, variants of this model that kind of uh, start to be, become fashionable of, like a few years ago. And so, um, as you can imagine, this is like a bare bones version, like a super, you know, like something that I can present in one slide, but there's all the bells and whistles that you can build that uh, as, as similarly as in CNNs, right? And so in particular, there's another way to connect with you know, uh, classic uh, things from basically computational harmonic analysis that reveal like a, a close connection, right? So in particular, as I told you, if you take a all pass filter like the degree matrix and you remove the adjacency, the low pass, you get basically a high pass filter, right? And this high pass filter is famous, right? It's actually the Laplacian operators, the graph Laplacian. And so you can, you can as well define the, the same model, the same neural network architecture through these operators, so through this Laplacian. And so that's actually something that we did uh, a few years ago, but we kind of uh, did it on the wrong way, right? Because we were kind of excited about this Laplacian operator, and we said, well, let's learn on the spectrum of the Laplacian, right? Which is basically, a, a, it's equivalent to considering as generators of the model all the powers of the Laplacian, right? All the operators that commute with the Laplacian. But this is, in a sense, a, a formally, a formally true and equivalent, but it's, of course, much more expensive, right? Because we need to, compu we need to compute the, basically the graph Fourier transform at every iteration. So hopefully uh, people realize that uh, after, after us that uh, we could basically use the same model but use it in a smarter way. So uh, hopefully that's where we are here. Okay, and so uh, someone, uh, so now I'm gonna spend the last uh, 10 minutes, uh, 15, uh, like 10-ish minutes talking about some of the applications of this, right? So the first one is that you realize that as I told you, right? That I have now this uh, uh, general way to learn on graphs that uses this high pass filter that is actually the Laplacian. But the Laplacian, is, is not the same status, doesn't have the same status as the family of, of differential, of uh, directional derivatives that I told you before, right? Uh, Laplacian is a second order differential operator, 
that in a sense is completely invisible to orientation, right? It's, a, it's an isotropic, isotropic operator. So in a sense, the Laplacian is hiding, basically, you, it's, can, it's hiding in, in, inside itself, basically, a first order operator uh, multiplied with its own adjoint, right? Basically, the same way that the Laplacian in the Euclidean domain, you can see it as the gradient composed with the, the adjoint of the, of the gradient, which is the divergence. So the question is, why don't we do the same thing on graphs? And the answer is obvious is that in general, in a graph, you cannot take the square root of the Laplacian and obtain a meaningful first order differential operator. But there's an exception, right? Is that there are some domains in which you can, you can still do this trick, right? And in particular, if we want to use the, basically a, a, this model to represent a surface, like, a, like a, basically here in that case, it's like a, it's like a planar surface, like a 2D, surface, a 2D shell in 3D, you can do that by kind of a boosting, augmenting the graph into what's called like a mesh, right? It's like a kind of a triangulation that contains uh, nodes, edges as before, but now it contains faces. So in that case, we can actually compute the proper square root of the Laplacian with something that probably here people know more, much more than I, it's called the Dirac operator, right? It's something that was initiated in, in quantum mechanics, right? So basically, this is a, the Dirac operator is a generalization of the gradient operator in the basically in quaternion space. Right, so we can actually, in, in that case, we can have, have fun doing, a, you know, a, using this model uh, to learn, like basically to try to predict into the future in very complicated uh, dynamics, right? So what you will see here is basically the, a neural network that is trained to predict the future, right? To integrate uh, dynamical systems uh, using different kind of uh, differential operators that, that are flat, right? So basically what, what you see here, well, I'm not going to spare you the details, is that uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you give the neural network, the graph neural network, the Dirac operator as a generator, it can learn how to predict things into the future in a way that it preserves a bit better the, uh, the, the structures that have where uh, orientation is very important. For example, the tip of the fingers, etc. Okay, so this is actually uh, joint work with, uh, oh, this is cut here, well, this is joint work with uh, some of the colleagues at, at NYU. Okay, and uh, we also apply this model uh, uh, actually with a, a bunch of uh, nice collaborations, uh, different uh, aspects of uh, coming from particle physics. And I think that Kyle is maybe going to talk a little bit about the kind of the physics of, of this setup. For me, it's just uh, yet another like supervised classification problem with a funny input, right? Uh, and, and Kyle is going to tell you much more about it. So we have been uh, uh, working a lot on basically uh, uh, doing a classification on the, uh, on the LHC from the Atlas team. And, and also uh, doing uh, neutrino detection on the ice cube uh, detector, right, in the, in the Antarctica. So here, the, the setup is, a, is a, of course, we only use simulated data for, for training. And the setup is that we have basically a classification problem where the input is just a, a, a signal measured in this super irregular domain, right? It looks like a hexagonal lattice, but actually it has a lot, a lot of actually irregularities inside. So we, uh, we use a, a graph neural network in the, in the, in the ice cube neutrino detector that basically has a kernel, like a, uh, the similarity, like the, the way where we can measure the distance between sensors is trainable, right? We have a, basically a, a model that can learn how to combine, how to relate information from different sensors. And the other thing that is uh, like a byproduct that is useful is that the, uh, because our input, uh, so basically our input is not is not relying, as I said, on a fixed graph, on a fixed domain, right? Every new measurement is a new graph. So the only thing that we care is the, is the places where the detectors fire up, the non-zero places, right? And so what we have is a, is a model that suddenly can be run, can run in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a sense much more efficiently, right? That if you have a, you know, if you have like a 3D convolutional network that has to work on this fixed domain, but most of the time, most of the sensors are zero, you are effectively wasting a lot of computation, right? So here we have a model that is uh, adaptive, and in a sense, as you can see, it, uh, it has actually a better detection uh, uh, performance as the two baseline. Right? This is like the CNN defined on the 3D on the regular grid, and this was the previous baseline that the, the team, the IceCube team, was, was using. So this is a work, again, my main author is Nicolas Coma, and he's uh, already, uh, he's going to present it uh, in a few months. Okay, so I have uh, a bit more than six minutes, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, then uh, I will also uh, talk about uh, maybe a, a another way, another area where one can apply exactly the same model that is a bit more touching over the upon the statistics and actually some questions on theoretical on computer science, right? So, so this is the uh, it's well illustrated by this problem of basically uh, learning a community structure in a graph, 
right? So, so this looks like a, it might look like an easy problem, right? You just take a, you know, you just take these two graphs and it's almost bipartite, it's, it's almost like disjoint, so it should be easy to detect the cut, but in fact, it's much harder, right? So this is the adjacency matrix, once I already gave you the, you know, like, like the article partition, and this is not what you observe, right? What you observe is basically the, 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 the graph without any kind of permutation structure, right? So, so this is a kind of an inverse problem where this signal, this is what your, these are observations, are hiding signal and noise, right? So the signal would be uh, essentially a who is neighbor of who, okay? Which is just a, basically a binary signal on the graph. And the noise is the fact that, of course, even if we are from the, you know, like let's say from the, you know, statistical physicists versus uh, particle physicists, you know, you might still talk with each other, right? Across each other, right? And so, so in other words, the signal is, is not, it's not always completely observed. So actually, this is a hard problem. And uh, in a sense, how hard is this problem is measured by, again, the notion of how strong is the signal versus how much noise do I have. And in that case, in, uh, one can uh, do a lot of uh, mileage by thinking about this problem with a simple uh, probabilistic uh, generative model, which essentially says, uh, first I'm going to draw at random like a, like a hidden label that says whether you are statistical physicist or particle physicist. And then I'm just going to, once I have this hidden label, I'm going to draw an edge with probability p if you are from the same community or with probability q if you are not from the same community, right? And basically the, the, how different are these two probabilities is going to make it easier or harder to detect. Okay, and so this is the signal to noise ratio. And then there's two um, like major strategies to try to infer the community. One is to try to maximize a quadratic form, for example, the, the, you know, the conductivity of the graph, or you, know, you try to find, basically you, you, you construct an operator on the graph, and then you believe that the spectrum of this operator is hiding the signal, right? And, and this is uh, complicated for many reasons, in particular because you are, uh, you are looking for you know, like, uh, things that maximize this quadratic form that have a lot of structure. For example, like here, the labels are just plus or minus one. And the other is to really exploit the generative, pro the generative model of the graph, right? I told you how to generate the graph, so one can look at this problem as doing a posterior inference, okay? And using uh, algorithms, uh, for example, like belief propagation, which is uh, like, a, uh, like the, the Sam Prather algorithm. And so actually there's a, there has been a lot, a lot of uh, very, very interesting work in the community, and actually Lenka and Florent has been, have been one of the kind of leading figures in trying to understand exactly how can, we, how can one basically leverage the two sources of, of basically these two algorithmic tra uh, trends and actually understand exactly for this model when can actually solve this problem you know, from an information theoretical perspective and when, when, uh, when can we solve it by using tractable algorithms, for example, like the leaf propagation. And so here, one of the kind of crazy things that we would have been set to, to try to understand is, well, is it also possible to learn these algorithms by just transforming into a machine learning problem? And so here, in, in the cases where we have this uh, setup, it's very easy to generate training sets, right? You just, uh, you know, as I told you, if I know how to generate samples, I can construct training sets with the ground truth, right? And so uh, in, in the case of a, uh, community detection, we, we can uh, get inspiration on how to design these neural networks by seeing how these estimators work, right? So the spectral estimators, they essentially, as I told you, construct a very well-crafted operator on the graph, and then they have to extract a very specific eigenvector, right? So the field of vector is a, like just, a for, just for the sake of, uh, I don't have a lot of time, but the idea is that if, if you look at the spectrum of uh, these operators, when you have the, the fact that there's noise, right, in the measurements, it creates this, uh, you know, uh, the, the noise has this uh, nice kind of, uh, it, com it converges to something that looks like a semicircle law, and then the signal is kind of hidden somewhere in the, in the basically in the edge of the, of the spectrum. Right? And so you can extract it by doing properly, uh, by doing what's, for example, doing the power iterations. So in a sense, if you take the power iteration algorithm, you can see it as really basically sending a signal, propagating, like multiplying it with some uh, operation on the graph, and then projecting it at every layer. So if you enroll this algorithm, you get essentially a, a graph neural network where the operator now is, we have to find it, right? It, we can express it maybe as a linear combination of operators that we know. So this is exactly, this is one particular instance of the model that we described before. And in fact, we, we can start by, you know, uh, uh, if, we, if we try to test this on simple cases, we can check that indeed it matches the best theoretical performance. So this is a, in, a, in kind of easy regimes where we know the, the ground truth algorithm, right? And so uh, 
Uh, and so, yeah, so this is uh, something that works well for the simple cases. And then the question that we ask, okay, is that now that we have this, how can we go to the next level? How can we go to the hard case? And so to go to the hard case, what we do, and, and again, very briefly, is that uh, we kind of upgrade this graph neural network that instead of working on the original graph, we can actually make it work on kind of a uh, luxurious version of the graph, right? So we can take a graph and we can construct a new graph that is, in general is going to be is going to give us information that is not directly accessible with this family of operators on the original graph. So in that case, we basically construct a graph from the edges of the original one, and we use as generator something that is called a non-backtracking operator. Okay, uh, probably if you haven't heard about it, you, you can talk to me offline and I will tell you more. Right? But the idea is that in this regime. Now we can go from the simple case to the hard case, where we actually we don't know how to find a tractable algorithm that matches the statistical principle, and see to what extent we can improve, you know, we can find maybe algorithmic clues on how to actually improve this threshold. And so, yeah, this is of course a very numerical, at, at this point very speculative, but what we see is that our models, in a sense, they, they tend to do uh, significantly better than the standard uh, algorithms that uh, are considered now to be kind of optimal in that regime. Uh, we can, of course, do it on real data, and again, we get the uh, similar gains. And so, just to, to, to wrap up, uh, I mean, I, I know I went very fast, but the idea is that I try to, pr to present to you like a picture of maybe how can we take inspiration from like ConfNet and computer vision and think a bit more generally in what are the, you know, like what class of problems can we solve with deep learning? So one possible answer is that if we assume this prior of geometric stability, we have a family of architectures that can leverage it and can learn very efficiently, okay, try, trying to combine the kind of the best of both worlds. But there are many things that we don't know, right? So, so one of the things that we have worked on and, and I couldn't present here is that we, we are studying the landscape of optimization of these models and how it relates to the, basically the hardness of, uh, basically uh, the original hardness of uh, inference. And then we are, uh, of course, uh, interested in how these models, instead of having a graph, you have a manifold, right? For example, the manifold like of, of, of symplectic transformations. So how can you do deep learning on continuous manifolds? And as you can imagine, there's many, many areas of application. So maybe most relevant for, for this community is uh, something that I've started to do work with, with, with my students recently, is this thing that I call like the non-commutative learning, right? So there are many problems where the reason why it's hard is the fact that things are non-commutative, okay? So for example, if you want to factorize a matrix, Right, the, the, the right algebra to, to combine small matrices, in, like atomic ma matrices into a large one, is actually a non-commutative algebra. So learn in this regime is something that requires, and one possible way we are exploring is using these ideas of graph to solve these kind of problems. So I guess that with that, uh, thank you very much, and uh, let's have a good lunch. Yeah.